Hi, everybody. Good evening. It is Thursday, Thursday, the 4th of April, and it is a rainy day in Boise. I don't know what the weather's like where you are at, but it has been raining all day, like buckets of rain. And I've been in a courtroom all day long. Big, huge day today in the Daybell jury selection. I'm going to go through it all with, with you. Thank you for watching. I'm Nate Eaton, and this is Courtroom Insider. Every night, we break down all of the developments of what happened in court during the Chad and Lori Daybell trial. And it appears that this thing's going to last a while. Eight to ten weeks, they're saying. We could be here into the summertime, and I'll be here with you every step of the way. I'm looking out the window, and... It is a dreary night, you know, so good day to be inside, although wherever you're watching from, which let us know where you're watching from. Uh, I hope that the weather is nice and beautiful where you are at. It is time for jury selection day four. Things got moving tonight, today, and we have some news. We have some news. Here's what we're going to talk about. Are we there yet? Have we reached the magical number of 50 who is in the pool of 50? What happens now? Vinny Politan from Court TV, if you've watched Closing Arguments, if you know who Vinny is, he's been at CrimeCon, he's, he's done a bunch of shows, I mean, he has a, I think he has a podcast too. Uh, I chatted with him, he, we're going to talk about the trial, and I think you'll find what he has to say pretty interesting. We're going to remember JJ, Tylee, and Tammy, and I'm going to answer your questions. So, let's get right to it. Where do we stand tonight? Well, today, two groups of question, two groups of jurors, potential jurors, were questioned. You remember yesterday we were close. I think we needed 13 to get to 50. Let me back up and explain explain the numbers for those of you that are brand new. So, on day one of jury selection, the judge comes in and he says, um, "We need, we're going to build up a pool and we're going to get to 50." Just one moment. Let me just put this in here. Um, we're going to build up a pool and we're going to get to 50. Once we get to 50, then we will do the preemptory strikes, which means that we're going to have all these jurors come in, one after the other after the other, in large groups. We're going to interview them. We're going to talk with them. We're going to get to know their feelings on certain things. And if there's reasons to dismiss them, they have to be for cause. So if you go in and say, well, if I serve a jury, I won't get paid for 10 weeks and then I'll, I'll lose my home, which some jurors said. So then they're dismissed because they have a cause. There are other jurors that the defense and the prosecutor might want to dismiss, but there's no reason. They haven't watched any news. They don't know about the case. They don't, they're not, it's not a financial hardship to them. Their spouse works or they're retired. They don't have any strong feelings about whatever, but for some reason, they don't want them on the jury. On the jury, for instance, the defense, John Pryor, might not want a mother of four who has kids the same age as Jaylee and Ty Chiley on the jury. So he might save that for one of his preemptory challenges, which is when you do not have to have any reason at all for dismissing a juror. You can just let him go. But up, until, we haven't gotten there yet. So Judge Boyce said we had to get to 50. And then once we got to 50, the questioning of the groups could, could cease, could stop, and then the strikes could happen. So on Monday, we had two groups of 16 brought in. Tuesday, we had one group. Yesterday, we had two groups. Today, we had two groups. And the all in an effort to build that pool as, as fast as possible to get to 50. There are some trials where jury selection takes a month. Can you imagine in some of the much more high profile cases, uh, this one's pretty high profile, where, where that might take forever. I'd, I'd have to look. I wonder how long the OJ Simpson um, pool took. Anyway, so here's where we stand tonight. Two groups were questioned today. I mentioned that. Seven advanced during the morning, the morning session, and then eight advanced in the afternoon. That took us to a total of 15 and a total pool of 52. Even though Judge Boyce said we were going to get to 50, when we got to 50, those four of us in the courtroom were like, hey, we're there. He's going to stop. But he didn't, probably because he just, the group was there. They had been questioned. It's better to have backups because what happens if when the 50 are supposed to return to court and two don't show, you've got these two backups. The pool consists of 24 women and 28 men. 
pretty good balance there. Pretty good balance. So what will happen now? Well, tomorrow, most likely, tomorrow morning, the judge didn't say this, but I'm assuming based on what happened in Lori Vallow's case, tomorrow morning, the 52 will return to court at 830, and then the preemptory challenges will happen till they get down to 18 people, 12 jurors, and six alternates. So here's how it works. It's You could compare it, I guess, in a way to, to kind of like a, a silent auction <laughs> where it, it goes very quick and you don't hear much. So the prosecutor, they, they, I, they have a list of all the juror numbers, and I do too, and it goes from, well, I don't, I don't know, it goes from 100 to 2,000 or something like that. It's not, and it's just whatever their numbers are, we're finalized. So the prosecutors have a sheet and they look at the sheet of the juror numbers and they cross off someone they don't want. And then the bailiff takes the sheet, goes over to the defense. The defense crosses off someone they don't want. Goes back to the prosecutor, same thing. Back and forth and back and forth until 16 on each side have been eliminated. Now, you also, if you're in the defense's shoes or the prosecutor's shoes, you also have to keep in mind that you need a, a few more in, in the back of your mind because what happens if you've got your 16 and the defense um, has chooses one of yours or you're the defense and the prosecutor chooses one of yours? Well, then you got to come up with another one. So I would imagine, I don't know this to be true, but I've spoken with other uh, attorneys who have said that they will kind of like have a, a list and put these jurors in categories like definitely want these are the people we want definitely don't get rid of these first these five or six then maybe okay neutral they kind of have a scale and then when it's all done the list is given to the judge and the jurors who make it are brought in and they're if tradi if tradition holds like how it did last year they were sworn in and then, or maybe they weren't officially like sworn in, sworn in, but they were told they were the jury. They couldn't consume any media or talk with anybody about the case to avoid it and then report back to court on Monday. And so I assume that's what will happen tomorrow. When the day ended today, the judge just said, okay, we're adjourned until tomorrow. Now, the, the, the other question remains, all these jurors are supposed to be on standby, but tonight this thing ended it. 5.30? 5? Around, yeah, around 5.30 it ended. They've got to get a hold of all 52 of these jurors and let them know or that they need to be at court tomorrow morning at like 8.30 or not, whenever they're told to report. So they shouldn't have left town. I mean, they, they should know that they're on standby so they could report tomorrow. And this is, in Lori Vallow's case, we had a, by 10.45 that Friday morning, we had a jury. And then everyone took a break for the weekend, and then the opening statements happened the following Monday. So I'm guessing that's probably how the thing will go. I could be wrong, and if the judge comes back tomorrow and maybe there was an issue with one of these jurors or something comes up or I don't know, and they drop below 50, and they have to bring in a whole other group, I can't even imagine that. But I guess that could happen, but I'm, that's just speculating on my part. So I hope that makes sense. I know you have a lot of questions about the jury and what happens like some really interesting questions like when they're waiting to go in the courtroom, what are they doing? Can they have their phones? Can they eat? Are they taken care of? Do they get lunch? I'm going to answer all those. And if you have any questions too, include them down below because I'm happy to, to chat about those things too. Um, okay. So without that, I was going to play a clip. There were some interesting jurors today. I just, I just didn't have time to pull it. Um, but there was a young father, a handsome young father of two kids who, when asked, will any of you have a problem seeing these very, very graphic photos? He raised his hand and said, I have two kids. And then they brought the issue up individually when he came back in the courtroom and they said, okay, you might have an issue because we all have an issue seeing those horrible photos, but would you still be able to put them outside of your mind and think, okay, I saw the photos, but it doesn't necessarily mean that Chad Daybell did it. He said he'd have a hard time. He said he'd be emotional with it. And um, it ended up he was he was released. We hadn't really seen that before. There was there was a woman the other day, a retired school teacher, who said that if she were to see stuff like that, 
she would have nightmares. She wouldn't be able to sleep, and she would replay them over and over and over in her mind, and she was also released. We had a guy today that he he had a, an, an issue with the conspiracy and, and what conspiracy meant and an agreement. What is an agreement being between two people? And he basically said it has to be written down or like set in stone, and they kind of talked him through the law because – Obviously, the prosecutor, I don't know if they have a written agreement between Lori, Chad, and Alex that we will kill the kids. And so if in this man's way of thinking, you could interpret that he would think, well, um, they didn't write it down, so he's not guilty of the conspiracy because he didn't actually physically do the murder. So they kind of talked through those things, and the man ended up, ended up advancing. He made it to the final pool. And again, it doesn't mean, I mean, out of these 52, only 18 are going to make it. So less, more than half of these people will go home. Like, like it doesn't mean it's final. They could, but more than half will go home. So with that on our mind, uh, I hope that answers your jury questions. But if you have them, keep sending them. Let's talk to Vinny Politan. Vinny is, I mentioned on Court TV, he's covered tons of trials. He was around when O.J. Simpson, Casey Anthony, I think he said Casey Anthony was the the most memorable trial he's covered. He's covered Lori Vallow from the beginning. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to talk with him about this case and some other cases. So take it away, Vinny. Well, Vinny, it's uh, so good to see you. And you are one of the uh, journalists, one of the people that has been on the Daybell case from the beginning, all the way back in 2020, if you can believe it, four years now. What are your thoughts that Chad's finally going to trial Chad Daybell? I think this is the big one, Mike. The Lori Daybell's trial was huge, right? But the trial itself, I felt like Lori was kind of like laying back and just taking it, almost as if she wasn't contesting it to a certain extent because of where, where she is mentally. I see Chad Daybell as a much different person. I mean, that most recent mugshot of Chad Daybell, to me, spoke volumes about where he is he seems much more like a typical criminal defendant who doesn't want to be locked up, wants to get out, and is going to fight for his freedom. And, and I think this trial will, will demonstrate that. It'll be a much different tone, um, and, I, and I think it'll be much more of a battle inside. So do you think we'll actually hear a defense? Because, you know, in Lori's, <laughs> it, we didn't. Right. We didn't. It was really bizarre. It was strange, but we absolutely will hear a defense here. And and I think the defense is going to be that Alex Cox and Lori uh, Daybell um, are out of their minds. She was, uh, you know, some sort of crazed stalking woman who trapped Chad Daybell and uh, Lori's crazy homicidal brother, Alex Cox, went out and started, you know, killing people. I mean, I think that's what it's going to be like. Um, I think there is some truth in that to a certain extent. Um, but like, if you really look at everything, I think prosecutors have a very strong case, but they're going to have to fight a lot harder here and make sure they tie everything together and are able to connect Chad to Lori and connect Chad to Alex as well and not see them as, as having having a, a different vision for what was supposed to happen here. You know, so, like they're, they're all in it together. He has, the prosecution has to connect all three, has to. Right. So if you're Chad Daybell's defense attorney, though, how do you get past the fact that the two kids were buried 20 feet from his back door, you know, 50 feet, and that Tammy Daybell died right there in her house and had marks on her arms by asphyxiation? Don't know. I don't know, but I know there will be an argument. And I and I know as clear as it looks right now, it'll look less clear inside the courtroom. That's just what happens. It, it happens in trials where there's a vigorous defense. Suddenly things that you sort of said, oh yeah, that's what happened. You're like, is that really what happened? Oh, is that possible? Mm -hmm. And I think we'll see some of that. When I, we, we, I may not be convinced, um, Folks watching at home may not be convinced, but it's not up to us. It's up to these jurors who have to come in with that clean slate of a mind, not be tainted like the rest of us are to a certain extent. And, and, and the prosecution has to build it piece by piece. But 
while that's happening, the defense is constantly, constantly not giving an inch, not giving a centimeter, and is contesting every assertion made. And this is what trials are, are, are supposed to be like and generally are like in, you know, 19 out of 20 trials. Lori's wasn't, and this one will be, and that'll be the, the vast difference. And there's going to be an, exp I don't know what that explanation is going to be unless you're in fear of Alex Cox. You are, um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how he could be in that bed. And unless they're going to say it's a coincidence that she died of natural causes, but these two children were murdered. How does that work? Yeah. That, that might be a tough sell. That's right. too coincidental. Well, I, there would have been a very different defense for Lori Vallow had she let her attorneys do their job. She oh, was yeah. very much driving that ship and do not go after Chad. The, the, the day that her attorney called Chad Daybell's books stupid, she was visibly upset. She was crying. She refused to speak to him. So there, that, that was as far as it got, as far as any blame on Chad. I think like you mentioned with John Pryor, the, the, the cuffs are off. He's going to go all out and point the finger. Oh, he, he will. And what, what people have to realize at, at home is you know, the role of everyone inside the courtroom and a prosecutor, your job is to seek justice. Justice is the truth. OK, and, and, and whatever it is, whatever the evidence leads to, that is the truth in the case. Your job as a prosecutor is to bring that out. You don't go in there just to get convictions if that's not what the evidence says. And you have to believe in your case. Your evidence has to prove your case. You have to have that conviction yourself. And you don't, and and your only obligation is to make sure that this jury is not misled, that you are doing everything you can to point them to the facts in the case that prove your case. The defense attorney who sits on the table next to the prosecutor, you know, is a lawyer like the prosecutor, has a much different ethical obligation. Their ethical obligation is to protect their client within you know within the bounds of, of not doing anything illegal but ethically you are not married to or obligated to the truth so defense attorneys as part of their ethical obligation can make arguments to things that they may not believe are true or things that actually aren't true but if the evidence suggests that that's a possibility they have an ethical obligation to make those arguments and that's something that I don't think jurors understand necessarily. Like you come into a courtroom and I just served on, on a jury. It wasn't a criminal case though, it was a civil case. Hmm. Um, but in criminal cases, I think jurors come in there and they see two lawyers and they see people making arguments. And they think, okay, it's, it's kind of like even Steven, each side has their lawyer, but their roles are so much different in our system of justice. And they have to be for the system to work. You need someone who's, who's, fighting for that accused defendant. And then you need someone who is seeking the truth, not just trying to get a conviction because for whatever reason, you can't be motivated as a prosecutor by anything other than the truth. If you're motivated by vengeance or politics or anything like that, you're not doing your job. You're not fulfilling your ethical obligation. Yeah. Well, this one, will be different. As you pointed out, there's different prosecutors. The two main ones are staying, but they, they brought in an, a special DA from the um, attorney general's office. Uh, of course, we have a different attorney for Chad. There's a few different charges, but also there, the judge is allowing a broadcast, which yes. I know you have fought for. We fought for from the beginning for Lori's case. It didn't happen. Do you think having this televised live stream for the world to see, is that going to change how things go? Will will there be a little bit more drama? What do you think? Um, not inside the courtroom. I mean, we've seen it for years at court TV. You know, for a lot of the jurisdictions we go to, you know, like this, it's their first big case. And they're like, oh, you know, no. Once the trial starts, I mean, you go back to what the job of the lawyers are, is or are, the, their jobs. They do their jobs. Their job has nothing to do with the the, the camera that is uh, broadcasting the case. They don't 
add any extra, you know, oomph or, you know, <laughs> they don't put on a show for the cameras. The show that they're putting on is for the jury. They want to win the case. The defense is not going to do something crazy because there's cameras there. They're going to do something to try to to try to raise a reasonable doubt. The prosecution is not going to say something in that courtroom because there's a camera that he wouldn't say otherwise because he or she is speaking to the jury. The only difference is, is that the public gets to see a public trial and the public ends up with a much more transparent view of our system, of what's happening, and we'll have a better understanding of the verdict. In the cases where there's no cameras and there are allegations and people talk about a case, then there's like radio silence, nobody sees it, and then there's a verdict, there's less trust in what happened. There's more skepticism about it. But there's much more understanding when we see and hear the evidence and the witnesses, the judges' rulings, and the arguments made. Everything makes much more sense to everyone involved. There's more trust. Yeah. It's our government. I'm not arguing to you, but I'm just saying it's our government. Like we should be able to see what they're up to. You know, there's no sanctity on the judicial branch of government. It's like every right. other branch, and it's and it belongs to the people. So um we should get to see justice in action. And the biggest I'm on my soapbox. Sorry, Nate. Keep but talking. The biggest, the biggest problem is the Supreme Court of the United States. Yeah. Does not allow cameras in there. Are you kidding me? Why? Why not? There is no reason why we shouldn't be able to see what the Supreme Court of the United States is doing, decisions that impact our lives more so than any other cases. Right. And they don't allow it. They allow a audio recording that we can play afterwards. What? Yeah. It makes no sense. But, you know, we've been fighting that fight for a long time. And then and then every local judge points to the Supreme Court and says, well, they don't do it. So we don't have to do it. it Ho exactly. Hopefully that changes. It is it is nice to have the fact that we do get to have cameras. They are court cameras, so they're not the best quality and they might be a little wide. We don't have any control over that. But um, at least there's there's a live feed. Another difference in this one, Benny, is the fact that Chad Daybell faces the death penalty whereas Lori Vallow did not. So, you know, the stakes seem to be a bit higher. There'll be more uh, uh, focus during jury selection as far as people's views on death versus life. How have you seen in covering cases, you know, for years and and trying cases, is there is there a difference in some of these cases when it's death versus life? Uh, absolutely. Um, the, the first change is the jury selection process is, there's a lot more scrutiny, it takes a little bit longer. OK, that's the first thing. Sometimes it takes a lot longer. That's number one. Number two is the way the case is tried based upon the, the facts of the case. Now, this one, they're absolutely fighting and contesting um, guilty, not guilty. You know, the guilt phase of the trial. There are some cases where the person like in a, a school shooter situation where the person is obviously guilty, there is no defense. And the, the whole trial is about keeping the defendant off of death row. Well, in, in this case now, they're going to fight the guilt phase, but while they're doing that, they're also attempting to save his life at the same time, from the beginning all the way to the end. So it, it changes it. Where it also changes the case is rulings by the, the court and by the judge, because every judge in a death penalty case knows that if this case ends in a conviction and ends with someone on death row, that the transcript and every ruling made in that case will be scrutinized by appellate courts mm -hmm. all the way up for years. So they are much more, I mean, judges are always careful, but even more careful. And sometimes you may see some rulings that kind of go more in the defense's favor in a death penalty case that might not ordinarily, like some of those that are close calls, sometimes in a death penalty case, the defendant gets more of the benefit of the doubt in a judicial ruling on evidence that comes in because of the scrutiny on these cases and what is at stake. Um, so that's part of it. Now, the other part is the jurors themselves. I think the defense bar, defense attorneys, usually argue that in a death penalty case that those jurors are more likely to convict someone because these are people that are um, 
that are okay with a death sentence. They believe if, if, if the crime fits it, it's, it's, it's fine. There are some potential jurors who are just against the death penalty, would never give it under any circumstances, and they get eliminated. Yeah. And defense attorneys believe they might be better um, because maybe they're a little more liberal in their views and they might be better in, in the guilt phase as well. What, what I've found through the years, I don't think there's much of a difference. I really don't. Uh, I look back and there are death penalty cases where they're found not guilty as well. So I think, I think there's just more scrutiny um, of these jurors and you get to know them a little bit better before the trial than you would otherwise. Right, right. Well, the one other thing that people are noticed is is with another change between Chad and Lori's trial. She was charged with conspiracy to commit Tammy Daybell's murder, not first degree. But Chad faces both first degree and conspiracy. In Idaho, the sentence could be the same. You can still get life in prison on conspiracy, um, which Lori got. Is that is that a big change? Are we going to see a different tactic? Do you think from prosecutors because they actually have to prove murder and conspiracy on Tammy? Well, yeah, and, and I think it's not just part of a plan, but like he's the one there doing it. He's there at the time. Now, with, with the, we know Alex Cox played a big role in, in, in all of this, right? And specifically with the children, um, how, di how directly was Lori there in, in the moment that the, the, the lives of the children and of Tammy Daybell are taken, it's not clear. But this is going to be very clear, very, and it's and it's a little different. It's like a man who married a woman and took the vows and raised a family, all these children and all these years and all this time together. And you're going to make the argument that he is the one that takes her life in the bed, in their bed. Is that where he takes her life? I, I think um, a, a lot of that is going to be. Uh, have a much more, I don't want to say the word graphic, but it's much more like specific and real in trying to paint this picture for the jury that this man was so over the top, you know, with wanting a life with this blonde hair, blue eyed woman who rolled into his life that he's going to, he himself is going to take the opportunity to, to murder this woman in their home. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And, and if, let me tell you, that is powerful stuff. And if the jury convicts him of that, I think they are very close to the death penalty at that moment mm. because of the level of, of the, the coldness that it takes to do that, the level of, of just evil towards this woman who's been nothing but supportive all these years. Wow. To me, that's that's going to be a big difference in this case. Hmm. All right. Well, what uh, any uh, suggestions or tips you have for what people should be watching as this trial begins and people are tuned in every day for the next two months? What will you be watching for, I should say? And to me, it's all it, yeah, like I understand the prosecution's case, but I want to hear specifics of what happened uh, to Tammy Daybell and how it was missed the first time and why the body had to be exhumed uh, and, and the explanations for all of that, I think is are important. I think um, the way the defense approaches Lori and Alex and what exactly the relationship is between those two and how they are not conspiring with Chad is the argument going to be that they're inspired by Chad, but not conspiring with him? Like he has these prophecies and these are just things that he has and that he says, but they're the ones who take them and like twist them and turn them and then start committing murders. Uh, it, I'm going to be listening for that. Like how, do, how, does, how does the defense attempt that separation because they're, they're they're so intertwined, and how do they make that separation? And um, that's what I'm going to be looking for. And will Chad testify? Mm. Lori didn't. Will Chad is the man who is used to speaking to groups of people and convincing them to believe what he's saying, right? He had followers. 
he had followers. Will he have 12 more inside that courtroom? I think that's the biggest question uh, that I'm waiting to see if it will be answered. Interesting. Well, yeah, Lori didn't testify, but she sure spoke at her sentencing hearing. And Ooh. I think that'll be one that you, I won't. Legendary. Forget. Yeah. Vinny, thank you so much. You can catch Vinny Politan every night, closing arguments on court TV. Uh, and uh, we appreciate your insight, Vinny, and look forward to hearing you throughout the next eight weeks, eight to 10 weeks. Thanks so much. Great to see you, Nate. Thanks. All right, there you have it. What'd you think? What'd you think of what Vinny had to say? Um, a lot of interesting points, in my opinion. I, I thought it was fascinating that he said, here's a man who's used to having followers. Will he gain 12 more in that courtroom? And uh, that's the question. The defense has a story to tell. And whether the jury believes him or not, th that's what it is. I guess really the prosecutors have to, they have, the burden is on them. And we'll see what the defense comes back with. So thank you again to Vinny Politan. Nice guy. If you ever have a chance to meet him, super nice guy. Uh, great guy, down to earth, fun. <laughs> My wife says he has great skin. We met him a couple, we met him last year, two years ago. And she's like, I have to tell you, what's, what do, what do you wear on your skin? It's so perfect and flawless. He said it was a vino. So I'm not getting paid to endorse that. But anyway, thanks to Vinny. So I want to know your thoughts yeah, on what he had to say and the fact that Tammy Daybell was found dead in her bed, in her bed. But according to Chad, what he told the investigators is she just died in her sleep, but then rolled out of bed. So um, anyway, there you go. Um, I do. There's so many questions and I want to get to them. But before we do that, uh, right before I, I came on here, somebody sent me a video clip of Tylee that has never been shown, Tylee Ryan. And uh, they asked to remain anonymous, but it's a beautiful clip. I want to show it to you. This is from 2013, I believe. So this was uh, a little while ago, but this is her as a kid. Hi, Ty. There you go. I know it's super short. I'll play it again. Um, Hi, Ty. That just shows just uh, that beautiful little girl. Well, teenage girl, I should say, who's no longer with us. So tonight we, we remember Tylee, who loved the water, loved the water, and JJ, who also loved the water, and Tammy Daybell. And I would imagine, and Charles Vallow too. I got an email last night saying, please don't forget Charles. And, and I haven't really, I've mentioned Charles, but I haven't really been honoring him at the end because this really isn't his trial. And, and when the Arizona trial happens, I plan to go to that and we'll talk more about him there. But you, but you are right, Charles should be remembered. So those are the, those are the people we're remembering, especially their families uh, as this trial now, as we have that pool of jurors and it's getting closer and closer to where this is actually going to kick off the ground and get going. And it's going to be a, could be a difficult, you know, the, the next eight weeks could be fairly difficult for, for these families as it comes to light. But uh, thank you for, to the person who sent that video. And if you have video or photos of JJ, Tylee, Tammy, Charles, that you want shared, uh, you can be anonymous or stories. Last year, I got some really great stories about uh, all of these people that I was able to share. They can be anonymous or I can use your name. Let me show you how you can reach out to me right there uh, on my Facebook. There's my Instagram, my X, and our East Idaho News YouTube. Probably the best way is to message me on Facebook and then or on Instagram, but really Facebook, and then or send me a message on Twitter, and um, I can... Uh, respond to you that way. I know that so many of you have been messaging, so I, I promise I'm not ignoring you on purpose, but I just am I'm kind of a little busy. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to us on YouTube, go ahead and do that. You can get alerts, especially now. Here's the button. Here's what you have to do. Whoops, wrong button. Um, if you hit this thing right there, you hit subscribe and then the bell, you'll get a notification when we go live and you can watch all of the hearings, especially starting next week. You're going to want to watch those if you're into the case. Okay, here we go. I want to do some shout outs and then some questions. First off, I have to shout out the security team that walks us into the courthouse every day. They're so professional. They wear the white shirts. They're so nice. 
we have to, it's like the airport. You have to take off your belts. You have to show them your keys. You have to take off your jackets, everything out of your pockets. They move people through very thoroughly. There's one woman that has the really loud voice that tells everyone, da -da 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 -da. I, I swear I could memorize her speech last year, but she's really nice. So are the rest of them. And I hear that some of them watch. So if you're watching, thank you for what you do to make sure we're safe and that we are protected in that courthouse. And over the next few days, you're probably going to need it as more and more people start to come to the to the trial and also to the bailiffs. There, there are some good bailiffs in there that are just so kind and so nice. I hear some of them watch too, and um, they 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 really handle it well. There's the one that I've told you about, courtroom daddy. He reads the instructions every day, although we, he hasn't had to do it this time around because there hasn't been very many people there this week. But I'm proud to say, humble brag, maybe not very humble because I'm announcing it to you, I was there for every second of jury selection. I did not miss a second. Lori Vallow's I had to go to the bathroom a few times. This time I made sure I didn't drink anything. I didn't miss a second. And my goal is to do it as much as I can, be there as much as I can for the remaining trial. Okay, shout out security staff, Marilyn Zimmerman. Thank you for watching. Lisa Tibbetts. Tippets, Jana Grace, Jared Edelmeyer, Pam Walker, Robin Hughes, Sarah Wilson, Midnight Crime Files from South Africa. I think, is are you the one that I interviewed last year? Did you come to the trial last year? There was a South African man from who came to the trial last year, and I was just thinking about you. If that's you, good. thank you for watching. Jenny Hansen and Harley Girl. All right, you ready for your questions? Here we go. A lot of them tonight. You've often said that Chad and Lori are not corresponding to your knowledge, but could they if they want to? I don't know how they could because every single letter that goes into the jail and the prison is read. And with Chad's case still outstanding, you would have two conspirators of a murder trial co corresponding with each other. And I don't think that the officials would allow it. Now, maybe once, if Chad is found guilty, maybe then he could because they've both been found guilty and there's no issue. Or if he's found not guilty, he could because anyone can write her a letter. Uh, but all of the mail is screened. S uh, second, do you think that Alex's TBI will be brought up during this trial? T a traumatic brain injury. Um, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. I, I don't I don't think it was brought up in the last one. Maybe maybe it was briefly, but um, I think if Alex was here and he was on trial, absolutely. But I don't know if it they they have to really it have to be pertained to this case and and why he maybe did what he did. I you know I guess he could if if the defense tries to blame it on Alex and the prosecutors say that, but I I'm not sure. If Chad wants to see Lori again, could he put a request through his lawyer to put her on the stand during the penalty phase to vouch for him? He could. He could. Um, that would be fascinating if he did. I don't know if his attorney would go through with it and the prosecution might object to it. But if she takes the stand, the prosecution gets to ask questions. And that would be interesting, too. You remember back in her trial, she never took the stand, but the, the defense was able to get in a recording of Lori that was about 16 minutes, I think, maybe 20. I don't, I don't remember the length, but it showed her giving her testimony, talking about Jesus and God and, and that sort of stuff that the jurors were able to get a flavor of what her mind was like. And they were able to admit it as evidence without having the prosecutors cross-examine, which is kind of a smart move on their ha behalf, because if Lori had taken the stand, the prosecutors would get to immediately cross-examine her. But because it was a recording, they couldn't ask questions on it. So all of those jurors got to hear her frame of mind, which, you know, it sounded a little out there. Why does Mr. Pryor stand and sit so much? That is a good question. <laughs> uh, I... I just think it's him. You know, the judge tells him to turn on his mic. He, he kind of marches to his own drum. Um, I'm hoping when the trial gets going that he will talk into the microphone because I think of you every time. I can hear him in the courtroom, but every time he's away from the mic, I think nobody at home can hear this. And the judge has to say or the bailiff has to stay, turn on your mic. I think it only happened three times today. So that's good. We're getting better. Uh, I know that today there was a, a portion where the mic's dropped what happened was the judge and the attorneys went into a sidebar and when they were in the sidebar uh the court muted the audio and they forgot to mute it when they came back so let's hope that that doesn't happen during the actual trial 
Cindy asks if I think Colby will be here at all. Uh, I'm sure Colby has been served a subpoena, meaning he's kind of on standby where they could call him to testify. I don't know how much interaction, if any, that Colby had with Chad. Of course, he had a ton of interaction with his mom and he called his mom on the phone. Will they admit that phone call that he had with his mom into evidence in this case? They could. And if so, they'll probably need him there to vouch for it. But I don't see him. He didn't come to, other than when he was a witness, he did not come to one day of Lori Vallow's trial. I don't know why he would come to Chad Daybell's trial, unless he's upset or angry. He has really tried to avoid the spotlight. Um, I've made attempts to reach out to him. He's not interested in talking, and that's you know his prerogative. But um, he might one day. I, 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 I hope he will, if he feels like it. Hi, Nate. I'm from Chicago, and I can't come to the courthouse to support. Hi, this is Emily, by the way. Hello in Chicago. I watch every day to sit in solidarity with the families. That's nice of you. I can. I also hear you talk about how kind people have been sending candy and food, etc. I'm just wondering if you know how we can send a gift card, word of kindness, or care package to the victim's families during the trial. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know other than being there uh, and giving it to them, They're, they kind of restrict what goes in and out of the courthouse. You can bring in food. You can bring in, you know, candy or small items, or you could catch them as they're leaving. But I know that um, they, they probably don't want the address of where they're staying at revealed. If our newsroom were here, I would say you could send it to us and we can get it to them. But we're, I'm in Idaho Falls and that would be too much. So uh, you know, if you send if I sh if you send me a message, I can pass it on to the families. I shouldn't say that because I know you all are so kind and you're going to send a message. <laughs> so please don't overwhelm my inbox, but I can pass it along to them and, and let them know that they're thought of. Or, um, you know, I guess if you wanted to send something to our newsroom in Idaho Falls, it would just delay in getting to them. I think they'd probably appreciate all your prayers and your thoughts. But I'll ask the families when I see them next week if... If, if you are, want to send them something, how they could. I know several people have sent gifts for Kay Woodcock to our newsroom, and I've just passed them on to her. So that's kind of you to think about that. Have Chad's adult children given any indication that they believe their father is guilty? Well, the last time they've publicly spoken was on t uh, 48 hours back in 2021 in September. And they, or wait, maybe it was 2022. I, I, it's it's been a little bit and they fully stood behind their dad um, that could have changed and if they're watching or you know them they're welcome to contact me on or off the record and let me know their thoughts but uh, I, I, the last I've heard from, from people close to them they still stand behind their dad and I don't anticipate seeing them at the trial unless they're called as witnesses during the penalty phase to vouch for their dad's character did they ever release Tylee's body and if so to whom they did they did release her body. They released JJ's remains. Let me pull up the story that I did. I, d I don't remember when. Um, Carly Ryan. We have a. Okay, here we go. This was from. Uh, December of 2023. So just a couple of months ago. A judge has ordered the remains of Tylee Ryan to be turned over to her family members. The 16-year-old was found dismembered and burned on Chad Daybell's property. The state of Idaho has maintained custody of Tylee's body since the gruesome discovery. Colby Ryan, Tylee, Tylee and JJ's older brother will likely take custody of the remains. JJ Vallow's body was released to family members in October. So that happened last October and then Tylee's remains were released in December. I don't know all of the, um, it would make sense for Colby because he is the next living sibling because she has no living parents. The only living sibling would be Colby. And so those remains would go to him. Um, and same with JJ, although I understand that other, uh, some accommodations have been made so that other people uh, can, can get, JJ was cremated as I'm sure Tylee was as well and so that uh, Colby doesn't have complete ownership of JJ's remains and that's that's all I'll say there and as far as Tylee I, I believe it's the same thing so yes her her remains have been released and they um back in December so and I from what I understand at least Kay and Larry have publicly said they hope to have some memorial services for these children 
and probably after all the trials are done. And I know that in the past they've said they want to do one in Louisiana and in Idaho and in Arizona. So, and it will be open to the public. And if we're invited to live stream it, we'll live stream it for you. Rosalie, in all seriousness, John Pryor has prior convictions. How can he legally be an attorney? An attorney, He does have prior convictions. Um, I believe he settled it and he can legally be an attorney because the Idaho State Bar did not disbar him. It's likely when he was charged that the State Bar opened an investigation and uh, did did their investigative work. Um, but he has not been disbarred and he has a law license. So he is an attorney in good standing. And I'm just going to pull up when he was. It looks like he was charged with battery in 2012. So it's been a while. And he it was a misdemeanor plea deal. So, um, yeah, that's probably why. I imagine if it had been a felony, it would have been far worse. But you can go research all of that if you want to to do that. Is the picking to... Is the picking of 18 jurors from the 50 open to the public or will that be held in private? No, it will be held publicly. But it, it, as I mentioned earlier, it goes very quickly. They go back and forth between the tables. We'll live stream it. You can see it. And then they'll announce the jury. And I mean, it could be over in an hour or two, maybe even shorter. Lori Vallow's dismissed at like 10 o'clock that morning. Hi there. Just wondering, do you follow other cases besides Daybell's? Uh, yes, to a point. I am not a quote unquote true crime reporter. It's not like I travel the country following these cases, but I have reported on crime my whole career. Uh, this is, of course, the biggest case I've reported on, but I'm also currently reporting on the Dylan Rounds case, the farmer from eastern Idaho who vanished in the Utah desert back in t Memorial Day almost two years ago. And hopefully there will be developments there soon. I've also reported on... Um, Dior Coons, he disappeared while camping with his family in 2015, still has not been found to this day. I can't believe next year it will have been 10 years, but he's been missing and his parents were never charged, no, no suspects arrested. Um, so I do report on those type of things, but um, and I report on stuff really in Idaho because I live in Idaho and my East Idaho news or a, a story that's tied to Idaho. If you have a really amazing case, really amazing case that you think we should look into, you can contact me. A lot of people ask if I plan to cover Koberger. Uh, we've done a little bit of that. We have news partners across the state of Idaho, but if if um, Koberger moves to Boise and goes to trial, I, I think I'll be there. What do you, I, let me know what you think. Should I, should I go? Should I do Courtroom Insider every night with that one? I, I think I might if there's an interest. If there's not, I probably won't because so many people have covered it, but it is an Idaho story and one that I, I I think is important to cover and one that I, I, I know Dateline has done some stuff. Keith has done it, but um, yeah. So yeah, I do report on other stuff too. Uh, will the jury in Chad's trial be able to take notes? Will Chad's family be at the trial? I talked about Chad's family. I don't believe his siblings will be there. Heather Daybell, his sister-in-law won't. She's been subpoenaed, so she technically can't because she's a witness. Um, yes, the jurors can take notes. Some took a lot of notes during Lori's trial, but they have to turn in their notes at the end of the trial. They can't keep them. So kind of stinks. I'd love to read those notes. Susan says, with the trial lasting eight to 10 weeks, do you think you're still going to crime con? We are attending from Idaho Falls and we're looking forward to seeing a familiar face. Last question, do you enjoy crime con? We're not sure what to expect. Hi, Susan. Well, I'm hoping it, 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 the crime con is the last weekend of May after Memorial Day. So it might be close. It depends on how fast things move. It'd be crazy if we had a verdict like the day before and then we go to CrimeCon and just talk about it. But um, I'm, I'm pretty confident I'll be there. The only thing that might prevent me is if we're like right in the middle of verdict watch. Like if the jury is meeting at that moment, I'm not going to leave here and miss that. But um, And CrimeCon goes over three or four days, so there might be a little bit of wiggle room there. But... Um, what did I think of CrimeCon? I was a little weary. The first, I was a little cautious the first year I, re I went. It was in Austin. And I, I'm like, I don't know. I'm not a huge true crime fan. It was fascinating. I got to meet so many amazing people, people that have survived horrific crimes, attorneys that have prosecuted horrific crimes. The Josh Powell case, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Susan Powell, the missing woman in Utah who still hasn't been found. The attorneys that prosecuted that case spoke. 
Um, Jean Benet Ramsey's dad, he's going to be back at CrimeCon this year. John Ramsey, uh, Nicole Brown Simpson's sister, all of these real, uh, um, Natalie Holloway's mom. I mean, all these really big people that have been in the news for these horrific things you're able to meet and hear from and hear a different side. And it's not just a media snippet. So I, I really enjoy it. I went back I, the following year and then my wife has come. She came with me uh, the last two to Vegas and Orlando, and I'm hoping she'll come with me to Nashville. So yes, Susan, I hope so. I'm interviewing Summer Shiflet there, Lori Vallow's sister. So I hope that uh, you'll come to that if you're there and all, all the rest of you. Sydney says, what are the jurors allowed to do while they wait? I assume phones are prohibited. Can they bring a book or something else to do? Actually, phones are not prohibited and they have to wait a long time. They're just not supposed to look up stuff about the case. Also, uh, in talking with Tom, the juror, they don't know what case it's going to be. They fill out a, that questionnaire, that survey. They show up at the courthouse and then they start kind of get an idea and they might have to wait two or three or four hours to, till they're called in. But they, um, they don't know what, what the case is and they can get on their phones. They can call. When they go out to the court, they can't have their phones in the courtroom. And then they're fed too. There's like snacks in there and there's drinks. And if they're there over a lunch break, lunch is brought in. So that's what they do. Um, then they can bring a book. Yeah, they can bring a book and read. Sylvia says, hello from the UK. Hi, Sylvia. I have watched your news coverage from the beginning. I want to commend you how excellent it is. Thank you. How did Lori and Chad react to the death of Alex Cox? Did they go to his funeral and was it natural causes? Um, I don't believe there was a funeral. If there was, it was quite private and fast. I need to double check on that. I don't recall. The The only kind of reaction that we're aware of is they, they played a, they didn't play a phone call. They talked about how when Melanie, the niece, called Lori and Chad to say that Alex was dead, she was so upset. She was so upset. And Lori and Chad responded that she needed to go to the temple to find peace and that hard days were ahead or something like that. They, they talked about it in the other trial. And um, if you go back and read the notes, you can see it. But anyway, that's that's kind of what happened. That, that's kind of what happened is that that's what we know. So I don't know if they were like, oh, God's plan is coming to pass. Maybe they truly believed it. I truly don't know. But I'm sure that I don't know if they were expecting it or not. Um Lori says, are they going to release the witness list? Are the children expected to testify? No, they won't release the witness list. They didn't in uh, Lori's case either. It is sealed. So I'll take notes. I can tell you this was my notebook for Lori Vallow's um, trial. And here at the end, I wrote down all the witnesses and the day that they testified. And then we got up to, I, I had to turn the page, go on the very back. We got up to 59, the FBI witness, on May the 5th. So here's an idea. Kay Woodcock took the stand on April 10th, the very first witness. The last witness was May 5th. And they went through 59 in less than a month. So we'll see. I think it's going to take longer this time because prior, you know, he's going to question these witnesses. In your opinion, if Chad turns, this is from Nick, if your opinion, uh, uh, in your opinion, if Chad turns on Lori, will it cause marital discord? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't, I, I don't know if anything will ever change Lori's mind. I, I don't. Elba says, what if Lori comes as a witness and takes the whole blame to protect Chad? Uh, it's it's quite possible if she shows up as a witness though that's gonna that's gonna be wild i mean we'll have a lot to do we'll do a two-hour courtroom insider that night but i could see her taking the blame on for him just based on what i've heard um maria says how can mr Pryor point the finger at Lori if Lori and chad are still married well i think that his job is to make sure that the guilty verdict is not returned on his client. So he will do whatever he ethically and morally feels like he can do. Okay. I think that's enough questions. I'm so glad you all were watching tonight. Thank you so much. Here's again, where you can follow me, stay up to date on the trial, Facebook, Instagram, X, and YouTube. Be sure that you subscribe to YouTube. Also tomorrow, uh, this is where you can watch 
the trial. It's it is going to start tomorrow at 8:30 Mountain. It has been starting at nine this week, but the judge said 8:30 tomorrow. He started a little early today. We'll start our live stream at 8:15. So join us on YouTube. I try to jump in the chat sometimes. So if you're chatting there, I mean, I don't. I'll be honest. I don't make it in there a lot because it's I'm a little busy, but. Uh, feel free to comment and chat in there. That's where we get a lot of our questions. Peggy's done a great job pulling all of those. And um, you can see where those where those are at and what we have. Of course, join me every night for Courtroom Insider, 6.30 Mountain Daylight Time. Oh, tomorrow, um, I might have my wife join me because I'm probably – I'm going home tomorrow. <laughs> so um, tomorrow at 6.30, I'll probably be at my house in Idaho Falls and it will be great. I'll be home with my kids. And we have had my wife. I got to brag on my wife for a second. We had new floors put in our house this week. We've been planning this for like three months. And the day that they could do it was April 1st, the first day of jury selection. So we had our, our tile in our kitchen torn up and our carpet. So it's a dusty mess. And and the, all the furniture we, we sold or moved out because we just had to clear out the house. So we have like no furniture, new floors, my, and it's spring break for our kids. So they've been home all week. <laughs> my wife is a saint. She's been taking care of all of this. And here's something funny. Yesterday, when she went to go to bed, she found a burrito in the closet wrapped up from the gas station. One of the workers left his burrito. If you're watching, we have your burrito. Um, so anyway, I'm excited to go home and see the family. And I... Um, she asked me to thank you for so many of you have been so kind in uh, sending along, uh, you know, some lunch or some snacks or someone sent me a gift card for C's chocolates. I don't need any chocolates, but I love the chocolates. So thank you. But anyway, thank you so much. Appreciate you being here. We'll be back tomorrow night, 630, talking about the latest. If we hit the jury number, if we are ready to go with opening statements on Monday. I'll tell you how you can get a ticket if you want to come into the courtroom next week if you're in town. And we will see you then. Have a good night.